Support Roller March Unfiltered, be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real as Roller Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roller Martin Unfiltered Daily Digital Show by going to rollermartinunfiltered.com. You can make this possible right now. What is happening in the United States House? Uh, Democrats are making their effort when it comes to targeting uh, uh, that nutcase out of Georgia, uh, Congresswoman uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene. Now, they are voting to strip her for committee assignments. Why? Well, let's see. She's a racist. She's a bigot. She's an idiot. She's a QAnon supporter. You name it. So, you know what? Before we play her speech, let's just go ahead and roll it. <laughs> Why? I got you, huh? Um, illegally selling water without a permit? On my property. Whoa! Hey! Give me your You don't live here. I'm uncomfortable. So, earlier today, Marjorie Taylor took to the floor of the U.S. House to plead her case to show everyone that she's a Jesus lover, that she is someone who... Oh my goodness, she's just she just loves the Lord and and all that sort of stuff along those lines. Actually, before I go to her right now, Congresswoman Lucy McBath is speaking on the floor. Uh, uh, she, uh, she was be on the floor, and so we're going to try to pull her speech. Uh, but before we go back to the floor, uh, if y'all want to just uh, let's see if your heart has been touched by by but just the words of now the humbled. Marjorie Taylor Greene. Thank you. Uh, Madam Speaker, my Democrat colleagues, Republican colleagues, my district back home in Georgia 14, to the American people, to my mom and dad, and my husband and my children. I've been here for one month and a day, and I've gotten to know part of my uh, conference, my Republican colleagues, but not even all of them yet. I haven't gotten to know any of my Democrat colleagues, and I haven't had to had, have any conversations with any of you to tell you who I am and what I'm about. You only know me by how Media Matters, CNN, MSNBC, and the rest of the mainstream media is portraying me. What you don't know about me is that I'm a very proud wife of almost 25 years that I'm a mother of three children, and I consider being a mother the greatest blessing of my life and the greatest thing that I'll ever achieve. I'm proudly the first person to graduate college and my family, making my parents very happy and proud. I'm also a very successful business owner. 
We've grown our company from one state to 11 states. I'm a very hard worker. I've always paid my taxes. I've never been arrested. I've never done drugs, but I've gotten a few speeding tickets in my day. What you need to know about me is I'm a very regular American, just like the people I represent in my district and most people across the country. I never ever considered uh, to run for Congress or even get involved in politics. As a matter of fact, I wasn't a political person until I found a candidate that I really liked and his name is Donald J. Trump when he ran for president. To me, he was someone I could relate to, someone that I enjoyed his plain talk, not, not the offensive things, but just the way he talked normally. And I thought, finally, maybe this is someone that will do something about the things that deeply bother me, like the fact that we're so deeply in debt that our country has murdered over 62 million people in the womb, the fact that our borders are open and some of my friends have had their children murdered by illegal aliens, or perhaps that maybe we can stop sending our sons and daughters to fight in foreign wars and be used as the, as the world's police, basically. Or maybe that our government would stand up for our American businesses and our American jobs and make the American people and the American taxpayers their focus. These are the things that I care about deeply. So when we elected President Trump, and then I started seeing things in the news that didn't make sense to me, like Russian collusion, which are conspiracy theories also, and have been proven so, these things bothered me deeply. And I realized just watching CNN or Fox News, I may not find the truth. And so what I did is I started looking up things on the internet asking questions like most people do every day. Use Google. And I stumbled across something, and this was at the end of 2017, called QAnon. Well, these posts were mainly about this Russian collusion information. A lot of it was some of what I would see on the news at night, and I got very interested in it. So I posted about it on Facebook. I read about it. I talked about it. I asked questions about it. And then more information came from it. But you see, here's the problem. Throughout 2018, because I was upset about things and didn't trust the government, really, because the people here weren't doing the things that I thought they should be doing for us, the things that I just told you I cared about. And I want you to know, a lot of Americans don't trust our government, and that's sad. The problem with that is, though, is I was allowed to believe things that weren't true, and I would ask questions, questions about them and talk about them. And that is absolutely what I regret, because if it weren't for the Facebook post and, and comments that I liked in 2018, I wouldn't be standing here today and you couldn't point a finger and accuse me of anything wrong, because I've lived a very good life that I'm proud of, my family's proud of, my husband's proud of, my children are proud of. And my, that's what my district elected me for. So in 20, later in 2018, when I started finding misinformation, lies, things that were not true in these QAnon posts, I stopped believing it. And I want to tell you, any source, and I say this to everyone, any source of information that is a mix of truth and a mix of lies is dangerous, no matter what it is saying, what party it is helping, anything or any country it's about, it's dangerous. And these are the things that happen on the left and the right. And it's, it is a true problem in our country. So I walked away from those things and I decided I'm going to do what I've done all my life. I'm gonna work hard and try to solve the problems that I'm upset about. So I started getting involved in politics. You see, school shootings are absolutely real. And every child that is lost, those families mourn it. I understand how terrible it is because when I was 16 years old in 11th grade, my school was a gun-free school zone, and one of my schoolmates brought guns to school and took our entire school hostage. And that happened right down the hall from my classroom. I know the fear that David Hogg had that day. I know the fear that these kids have. And this is why, and I say this sincerely with all my heart, because I love our kids, every single one of your children, all of our children. I truly believe that children at school should never be left unprotected 
I believe they should be just as protected as we were with 30,000 National Guardsmen. Our children are our future and they're our most precious resource. I also wanna tell you 9-11 absolutely happened. I remember that day crying all day long watching it on the news. And it's a tragedy for anyone to say it didn't happen. And so that I definitely wanna tell you, I do not believe that it's fake. I also wanna tell you- I ain't, I'm done listening to her. Free in the panel. <laughs> Now, y'all, what I didn't get to with the part, matter of fact, y'all find it for me. Y'all find it for me when she said, I'm a Christian, I love Jesus, uh, and folk make mistakes, and uh, uh, we all sin, and uh, y'all, she was playing that Jesus card real hard. I've been humbled uh, by this, and I've been, uh, mm-hmm. There have been a lot of speeches on the floor today, lighting her ass up. Let me tell you who brought the funk. Steny Hoyer of Maryland. Watch this. I heard about motherhood today. Two of those women, between them have six children. They're mothers. One of them does not have children. And she's come to this body asking for more housing for people, for more health care for people, for more income for people. How awful. And they're not the squad. They're Elon. They're Alexandria. And they're Rashida. They are people. They are our colleagues. And yes, you may have disagreements. But I don't know anybody including Steve King, who you precluded from going on committees for much less. And this is an AR-15 in the hands of Ms. Green. This was on Facebook just a few months ago. That is a message of peace and reconciliation and peaceful democratic dialogue. The squad's worst enemy, AR-15, in hand. Mm -hmm. Sounds like the guns I fled. Mm. I have never, ever seen that before. Mm. Y'all go ahead and play that. I just love Jesus. Opportunity, and I'll tell you why. I believe in God with all my heart, and I'm so grateful to be humbled, to be reminded that I'm a sinner and that Jesus died on the cross to forgive me for my sins. And this is something that I absolutely rejoice in today to tell you all. And I think it's important for all of us to remember none of us are perfect, none of us are, and none of us can even come close to earning our way into heaven just by our acts and our works, but it's only through the grace of God. And this is why I will tell you as a member of this Congress, the 117th Congress, I'm a passionate person. I'm a competitor. I'm a fighter. I will work with you for good things for the people of this country, but the things I will not stand for is abortion. I think it's the worst thing this country has ever committed. Mm, abortion is the worst thing this country's ever committed. How about slavery when they ripped the babies out of the wombs of black women? See, here's the deal here, uh, Erica, uh, you, you being from Georgia, with this trifling-ass woman right here. 
Steny Hoyer nailed it. She stood up there and said, I've gotten a chance to know some other Republicans in our conference. I haven't gotten a chance to know the Democrats. They only know me from what they've heard of from media matters and CNN. No, 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 no. Cory Bush know about your ass. Right. Mm-hmm. When you and yeah. your staff accosted Congresswoman Cory Bush in the hallway, mm-hmm. forcing her to move. Your, your Jesus-loving, trifling ass didn't all of a sudden, yeah, you weren't loving the Lord when, when you went off on her. You, you, you wasn't humble and you wasn't a mama and a loving wife and a Christian when all that was happening. But now they want to jack your sorry country ass. Now you want to do, and, I, and earlier today, y'all, I was on with David Brody. And and he and, and David, you know, David, you know, look, the good guy, we had a great conversation. And, you know, David felt that I wasn't extending, you know, the <laughs> compassion to her uh, that was needed. And, and you know, uh, being a Christian, I like, but I said, bro, <laughs> I said, let, let me help you out with that. I said, first of all, let me be real clear. I said. Married to a minister, I'm a Christian author. I said, oh, I know the word. I said, but see, what y'all can't handle is that what she did today is what that German theologian who studied Mm. at Abyssinian Baptist Church, who got a taste of liberation theology and Mm. took that back to Germany when they were Mm. fighting Hitler. Y'all, his name is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Well, that German theologian, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, laid out a concept called cheap grace. And (laughs) cheap grace is when folk like her stand there with their white tears, speaking Mm. about their white Christianity, asking for forgiveness, when knowing full well tomorrow you're going to go back to doing what you were doing before. Dietrich Bonhoeffer called that cheap grace. When you go to God and say, Lord, forgive me, I'm sorry, then you will hold a day and then you turn around and you start a hoeing tomorrow, but then you want to ask God for forgiveness about your hoeing tomorrow, and then when you hold tomorrow, you ask God for forgiveness and you turn around and you hold back on Saturday and Sunday. I'm not talking about her. I'm talking about the people who do that. Lord, (laughs) forgive me. Lord, forgive me. Back to hoeing. Lord, forgive me. Back to being a freak. Lord, forgive me. Bonhoeffer called that cheap grace. That is what she think we just going to sit here and uh, accept. No, not happening. (laughs) And um, from Matthew 7, 21 through 23, um, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. That is exactly Mm -hmm. who Marjorie Green is to her fucking core. Don't put my Lord and Savior's name in your mouth as a way to excuse the shit that you do on a daily uh, on a daily basis. My big mama said something to me years and years ago, and it has stuck with me. She said, when you open your mouth, you remove mm-hmm. all doubt. All she is is a racist. When mm-hmm. I was in uh, on the coast, um, which I know many of us have talked about, in Ghana, and I stood in the dungeons and looked up and saw where white people were having church while my mm. ancestors were chained but naked in a dungeon mm. about to leave their country on a uh, on on a gross gross um um uh, journey through the um through through the transatlantic um, the, through the atlantic and i can't even i'm i'm so angry i am so angry because i'm tired y'all we have got to engage now and I'm saying that because folks like Marjorie, that she is under the umbrella of blamelessness. So she'll always be blameless. She's a white woman, so she'll always be blameless. That right. speech fell exactly where it um, should have, on the floor. It has no power. What we have to do is understand that these folks are being trained. 
they're being donated to, they're giving space to actually occupy these spaces, have these committee spaces, because folks in power understand that they need other people to continue on their work of oppression. So this is what we have to do. It's not just during election time. This type of civic engagement is something that we have to be prepared to do every day of the week. Republicans are always grooming the next Marjorie. They're always mm. grooming the next Mitch McConnell. Where are our Cory Bushes? Where are our Ayanna Presley? Where are more of our Madam President Kamala mm. Harris? Those are the folks that we need to be training up to assume power to let them know, no, 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 no. What you will do is you will be a member of Congress. You're going to be in Senate. You're going to be in the House of Representatives. That is the type of training that we need to have uh, and that we need to uh, focus on if we expect to make sure that we retain any semblance of democracy, not only just now, but for the years that are to come. Because Marjorie, that type of person, they're going to continue to roll those out left and right. Uh, mm. Let's actually go to the, let's go uh, in a second. Give me one second. Uh, we're going to go to uh, Capitol Hill. Uh, the vote uh, has been taken. Go. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Florida seek recognition? Madam Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to address the House for one minute and revise and extend my remarks. With that objection, the gentlewoman is recognized for one minute. Madam Speaker, it is with a heavy heart that, Madam Speaker, can I ask for the House to be brought into order? The House is not in order. Yeah. Madam Speaker, it is with a heavy heart that I rise to honor the lives of two fallen FBI agents, Daniel Alfin and Laura Schwarzenberger. On Tuesday morning, while... So the House is actually voting right now, uh, and I la I, the, the time is up. I'm not sure if it's extended, uh, but right now it's uh, 230, uh, 230 votes, 11 Republicans uh, Reese voted with the Democrats to strip her of her committee assignment. And they still ain't shit right along with her. So <laughs> that's fine. Uh, uh, Erica just preached the whole word. So let me just start right there. And I, I just have to say, listen, this is who they are. This is not, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, she sat up there and still was talking shit about all kind of stuff. She was doubling down on all kind of stuff. She does not love all our children. She's sitting up there. You know, the reason why she's there is because she was attacking white kids. Okay, let's be clear about that. Not because she was going after Ayanna, I mean, uh, Ileana, rep the Congresswoman Ileana Omar or Rashida Tlaib. It's because she went after David Hogg and her and his sister. And that is appalling. It's disgusting. OK, so she deserves to get all this stuff stripped. She is a truther about all this other kind of stuff. She wanted to deflect blame. Lady, you are 46 years old. You too damn old to be sitting mm. up there acting like you ain't know no better. <laughs> oh, I was on Facebook. Oh, I was on Google. I don't say that. I'm not going to say the B word on your show, but I will say motherfucker, please. OK, you was all <laughs> up in there. Uh, all into it. It got you to the to the Congress. And now you want people to get to know who you are. Girl, bye. Period. Right. Yes. Yes. Right. <laughs> yes. All right, folks, back to our Gold Mark Unfiltered video in just one moment. It's time to be smart. When we control our institutions, we win. We win. This is the most important news show on television of any racial background. Y'all put two, three, four, five, ten, fifteen, twenty, thirty dollars on this and keep this going. Mm -hmm. What you've done, Roland, since this crisis came out in full bloom. Anybody watching this, tell your friends. Go back and look at the last two weeks, especially of Roland Martin Unfiltered. I mean, hell, go back and look at the last two days. You've had sitting United States senators today, Klobuchar and Harris. Whatever you have that you have, you can bring to Roland Martin Unfiltered to support it. Please do, because this information may literally save your life. Watch Roland Martin Unfiltered daily at 6 p.m. Eastern on YouTube, Facebook, or Periscope, or go to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Support the Roland Martin Unfiltered Daily Digital Show by going to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. You want to support Roller March Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real as Roller Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roller Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to RollerMartinUnfiltered.com. You can make this possible. 
folks. I want to talk about this next story. Uh, typically, I, I ignore stories like this. Okay. Um, I don't do a lot of entertainment and sports on here. I do no gossip uh, because, frankly, we are inundated with that in Black America uh, when it comes to pop culture and entertainment and sports. But I saw the video that Chloe Bailey put out celebrating her one million uh, social media followers. And then I was, I, 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 I saw it. Then I saw all these, I saw the tweet. All, all of a sudden, then this reaction, all these people who were trashing her because of her video. And it frankly pissed me off. So here's the original video. So the video was because she surpassed a million followers on Instagram. Nothing wrong with the video. No problem, no issues. Yet she then began to be attacked by various people, which led to her going back on Instagram to explain and getting tearful in doing so. Much And I think for every woman out there, don't change who you are to make society feel comfortable. And I'm telling myself that's not what I'm going to do. And even when I posted the video yesterday, I was posting it because I was saging and doing Pali Santo and I was like, let's spread positive vibes. I didn't even really notice you all would talk about my ass because I'm like, oh, okay, I'm just walking in for one second, two seconds, you know? And I feel like I've shown my ass more than I have with that. Like if you look at our performance videos, the last performance we had in December, like I was just so excited and on stage and just being myself. So I don't know. I just felt it was important to address it so you guys get to kind of get to know who I am more in inside. And it's really hard for me to think of myself as a sexual being or an attractive being, quite frankly. So when I see all the uproar about my posts and stuff, I'm a bit confused. Like I really don't understand because I've never seen myself in that way or in that light. So I take it as a huge compliment that you all even think of me as a sexual, sexy being. And you know, it's never, I don't post what I post for people to, I don't post what I post for to get attention. I don't need that. I am a very spiritual person and I feel like during quarantine, I got really close to God. So even in the lowest moments when I felt like people weren't seeing me, when people weren't paying attention to me, God was. And I've learned I don't need outside attention. So you all seeing what I'm posting is just me being me. And yeah, I just hope you can just see who I am and that's it. So. So here's why I'm pissed off. I'm pissed off because black women in this country have had to endure a white supremacist society saying that the features of black women are shameful, are despicable, ugly, and not appealing. We live in a society where a black woman's hips, her lips, her breasts, her thighs, her calves, her hair, her facial features, is all seen as ugly. That is the historical lens by which black women have been defined in America. You've had 
white folks, including some black folks demean and criticize the physical features of Serena Williams and Venus Williams. We've seen them say things about other black women. Oh, they are too muscular and, 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 and they, oh, that's not appealing. Yet every single feature of black women has been sought after by white women. Full lips, full hips, breasts, thighs, butt, all of that. All of a sudden having an ass is all the rage. The Kardashians and the Jenners have literally built multi-million dollar, billion dollar companies appropriating Black female beauty and America's, oh my God, that's wonderful, including a lot of black men. Yet this sister decides to do this video and she do other videos and now all of a sudden that's bad? Now all of a sudden Folk are saying, put your clothes on. They're criticizing her hair, criticizing it all. Really? So that little Jenna girl, go buy some breasts and some hips and some butt and some lips, creates a whole makeup line, companies value at a billion dollars. Ooh, look at her being a businesswoman. You got all these athletes. Oh my God. Let me tell you something right now. Kim Kardashian gets divorced from Kanye West. It's going to be a whole line of folks lining up trying to get with her. Oh, the exotic features. Oh, look at her. Go to the conservative website, Daily Caller. Oh, they 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 posting videos, photos of women. New York Daily News. That that that's a that's a, a white woman who's a golfer. Page. I forgot her last name. I swear she on the New York Post every single day, wearing some tight, showing her breasts and showing her body. But when a black woman decides to have a positive body image now she's being attacked oh hell no 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 hell no i was a part of the youtube black content creator summit that took place in atlanta uh, in uh, 2019. uh chloe and hallie were there Br briefly i mean just briefly you know, we were all in the group, didn't have a conversation with them. Don't know them, have never said chat with them. And I could have easily skipped this topic, Teresa. But the reason it matters, I got nine nieces, four nephews. And I've got a mom of three sisters. Numerous aunts, numerous female cousins. And what I need our people to understand is that when this generation of black girls sees the hate being thrown at a Chloe Bailey, that can have a negative impact on how these same black girls black teenagers, young black women now see themselves. And so then they then, oh, well, if Chloe isn't good enough, then I'm ugly. Then I'm not worthy. Then I don't look as good. And then when there are those people who then begin to body shame them and criticize them 
and condemn them on social media, they then begin to internalize that. And that then plays a role in some folk deciding whether they want to take their lives or not. And so I, I, I need folk to understand, especially folks who are watching on African American, that one of the things that we must do is actually a Affirm blackness, affirm black beauty. See, I did a um, eighth grade graduation for Father Michael Flager. And whenever I do graduations, I, I stand there and I shake the hand of each graduate, whether that's an eighth grade, whether it's a high school, whether it's a college. But also I watch people, I watch people. And I notice how nearly every girl, how they hug, that was this hesitation, that was this distance. And I said, Father Flag, y'all got a problem in this, with the, in this class. I, I'm seeing the relationship. I have always made a point of hugging nieces and nephews. I don't believe in that distant thing. I don't believe in, oh no, no, I need you to need you to stay away from me. Because see, what I understand psychologically is that if you grow up and you do not have a loving environment, if you grow up and folk don't hug, they don't really speak, there's sort of this distance, that then carries over into all of your relationships. And so for me, that is important because I believe as a black man, as a black man, that I need to show the black girls and the black women in my family how to have healthy relationships where we are not afraid to hold each other and embrace each other. And I dare say we cannot be silent when a black woman a young black woman like Chloe Bailey is attacked because she needs to have the public and virtual embrace of our people where we are affirming her black beauty so she understands there is nothing wrong with who she is, Teresa. Yeah, on so many levels, uh, Chloe Bailey's story is similar to millions of young women and women who are older right now, um, who has still been going through so much of this uh, body shaming and, and much of the humiliation um, that has been going on, not only in our culture, but through social media, through the impact of words. and. It's, it's very, you know, disconcerting because as we look at our young women, we can mentor, um, you know, to, to an, a certain extent through organizations, through programming. But you're right. It takes the love. It takes the hugs. It takes um, that intimacy of knowing what a relationship feels like, what love actually feels like. Because otherwise, they're going to social media outlets um, that is telling them that they need to enhance or they'll get targeted ads, you know, filtered to them um, based upon looking at, you know, uh, one of the Kardashians line of of, of, of of work that they've done to their bodies or to their face or, you know, showing that they can, you know, have a black man um, and, and still be able to talk about black issues. It's, it's very interesting. But I think what you know what I what I uh, got from you, Roland, is is the opportunity. You know that women like myself um, and other women who are in leadership who are doing um, well is to give that compliment, to give that 
um, you are, you know, bold, you are beautiful, you are um, everything that you need to be. Um, and so I think there is, you know, something that um, we all need to do is to when a young black woman is being attacked, the community and the culture and every other organization, but as an individual just needs to say something. Um, I think the silence in our communities have, has hurt in us um, so much um, that, you know, we're seeing more young women in abortion clinics than we are seeing them um, in business schools. So I think there is a lot to say there, but moreover, when we police black women, um, especially their bodies, we are essentially telling them that they are not worth it. But we all know that we are worth it because it, it looks like capital America, um, America is capitalizing off of us. So um, there is more that we need to do. But I, I believe it starts with us individually taking a conscientious approach on how we deal with each other first. Um, Rena, the I, I, I've raised the point. First of all, I have a typical ban on this show uh, when it comes to anything Kardashians or Jenner, um, like flat out ban. But the reason I'm, I'm I'm raising this is because I understand double standards, and I understand how America, white America will fully embrace a Kim Kardashian, Jenner's, and then black folks do the same. But then I also understand how black self-hate can also lead to a condemning or a condemnation of a Chloe Bailey. When I look at some of the comments, oh, she's sitting here and she's, you know, doing videos and she is uh, wearing her underwear. Please, please tell me the difference between that and somebody in a bikini P please tell me the difference uh between folks uh, who are hugely popular and making hundreds of thousands of dollars and millions of dollars as swimsuit models P P please tell me the difference when cbs aired the annual victorious uh, victoria's secrets uh fashion show uh, from miami which last i checked were women who were walking down runways with huge feathers on wearing underwear. I, I really think what we're dealing with here, Rena, is we're dealing with people who are not happy when a black woman decides to say, I'm beautiful, I'm sexy, and I really don't care if y'all got a problem with it. And in one of her videos, she talked about how she had to deal with um, uh, feeling negative about her own body. Uh, what people have to understand is that this affects black women when you have this level of hatred. When black people have said, you've got nappy hair. Uh, we all remember the video of the young black girl who was having her hair comb uh, and the sister, I believe she was a babysitter, I, I was, was a mother, I can't remember, who was like, no baby, you are beautiful. Baby, you are gorgeous. The reality is uh, because of the history of white supremacy in America and black people being victims of white supremacy, then taking on the Stephen mindset of white supremacy, we then can have self-hate not realizing where our self-hate originated from and it wasn't from us, it all stems from white supremacy in America talk, Roland, Black women are particularly vulnerable to the effects of European standards of beauty. That's what this is about, European standards of beauty. And that's what we live with in this country, because those standards emphasize skin color and hair types that exclude many Black women, especially those with darker skin. So uh, you know, I, I've read a lot of research on this. Uh, I want to talk about Chloe Bailey in just a second. But 
there's a lot of research out there that indicates that European standards of beauty can have really damaging effects on the life trajectories of Black women, especially those with dark skin, and primarily in the form of that internalized self-hatred that you just mentioned. So it's really important that we start addressing these effects right away. And, um, you know, when I watched that, that video of Chloe Bailey, all I saw was happiness radiating from this very beautiful woman. And I'm not just saying that because we're talking about standards of beauty right now. Her happiness was, was radiating. She was positive. She wasn't doing anything um, salacious. <laughs> I, I mean, that's one way that society has generally judged women. But it's like when a woman that is rail thin, white, wearing skimpy underwear is walking down a runway in Miami with popular singers singing all around her and big feathers, that's suddenly cool. But this chick is just being her authentic real self and celebrating. She's black joy. That's all it was on display. And she was being herself. And, and I felt my heart just goes out to her, honestly, because when she talked about not seeing herself as an attractive woman and the sexualization around it, uh, just I just felt like, wow, what are we what are we doing to women? And I've grown up in this era and 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 without really dating myself I, I, I came up I, I'm closer to 40 than I am to 30 let me put it this way I came up in an era where all the magazines that I ever saw were always white women were always rail thin and I hated my curves I was ashamed of the melon in my skin I remember going to my senior prom my mother's friend came and did my makeup 18 year old me didn't really need makeup I had all right skin but my, I look like I have white face because the foundation was so light and and it's because of where I grew up in rural West Virginia, there just weren't that many people of color, uh, black, indigenous people of color. There just were not those that many of us. And so what was available in the drugstore even wasn't really reflective of our skin tones. And I look back in those pictures and I cringe because I didn't need makeup. I didn't need that foundation three shades lighter that my mom was sort of saying, make her lighter, make her lighter, because these are the standards of beauty that our bodies, women in America that came up in my, in my age demographic, primarily, these were the messages is being sent to us by corporate America, by advertising execs, that we were not right if we weren't white, that any amount of melon in our skin um, suddenly put us in a different category. And, and I just want to thank you, Roland, really genuinely from the bottom of my heart, being honest and open as a male about how you embrace your family, your relatives, and just showing them it's okay who you are. Your body is just fine the way it is. I have, I even dealt with feelings as, as recently as last month of feeling ashamed going somewhere and putting on a blazer because I was ashamed of looking too busty as if that was going to welcome something at my age. And I'm a married woman, a mother. And these are the, still the ingrained standards, unfortunately, that have pervaded the minds of, of people of color, primarily black women. And it, in, it infuriates me when I see, it, look, the Kardashians and Jenners, I rock with you because you do not touch that stuff. Um, but I, it infuriates me to see them totally app uh, appropriate what is blackness and be celebrated for it. Yet the very people that these traits belong to are being shunned and being given this kind of treatment that Chloe was, it is not all right. And I, I just want to start, I want us to have an even more open dialogue. I'm confident that by the time my girls get older, they will be celebrating the skin they're in and they will not get the messages that I got um, that were, were truly to, that, that I was some sort of exotic creature, that I was, I was not like everyone else when, when genuinely I was just like everybody else inside, but I, I was being judged on things I couldn't change, like my skin color. And uh, I just want to give one last thing here, one really small thing. I was uh, visiting New York City when I was in my early teens and I was from West Virginia and I, I had great parents that always actually, besides my mom, a little bit of friction there with the skin color stuff. But my, my dad definitely didn't subscribe to any of that colorism stuff. But I was visiting New York City and I was on a train with a cousin and, and there was a black woman who came up to me and she said, how much for your hair? Can I buy your hair? You're Indian, right? And I was like, no, I'm American. My parents are from India. And, uh, and I just couldn't believe she wanted to buy my hair. I thought I was so confused. I didn't understand why she wanted to buy my hair and because I looked at her hair and I liked it. I was like, I like your hair. And this is, I was an innocent young girl back then, but this is, this is a vignette of exactly how, how wrong society has treat, uh, treated black women and to make us, uh, to bl make women of color, but make my black girlfriends think that they were not enough, that they needed to be, have something else, be something else to be beautiful. So wrong. And I just, I look forward to the beauty industry changing. I've seen evidence of it changing and I'm confident that it'll continue to because that's what needs to change first, genuinely. 
this. This was a comment posted by somebody named CD on the YouTube channel, and I think it's pretty stupid. Um, Black American women are more sexually liberated than any other group of women. Other groups of women are inspired by them, so I don't buy this. Well, CD, you don't buy it because you don't actually understand history. Uh, black women, black black women um, have actually uh, been the targets, been been subjugated uh, to violence and abuse in this country, um, not seen as models of beauty. Um, and then, when a black woman is seen as a model of beauty, it is by white standards. Typically, she had to be light skinned and have good hair. Uh, we know, Joseph, uh, when there was a magazine that changed, the, altered the features of Beyonce, of Kerry Washington on their magazine covers. Skin was lightened, was thinned as well, because there were photo editors who said, ah, that, that, that's, a, that's a little too much hip, that's, that's a little too much butt. We can't quite have that. Uh, and so what the person said is incorrect. And I think what ends up happening is, uh, is that we, we, we go through this in this society where, uh, again, if you are a black woman and you are, you are proud and public of your features, it's a problem. I mean, I think back to the idiotic black men, um, one of them I'm not going to name who I think is just stuck on stupid. I don't know why anybody follows or listens to him who condemned Megan Thee Stallion and Cardi B when they came out with the WAP song. I, 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 the, Snoop Dogg even had the audacity to get do provide a comment on that when I'm like, Snoop, you talked in a lot of your music about sex. But when these two black women, when they decide, when these two women of color decide to put a song out, making it clear how they feel about sex, oh, no, 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 you're not... You're a lady. You shouldn't be doing those things. This is what we're dealing with. And I need people to understand it does have a negative impact on young black girls who will be black women one day. Absolutely. And I think part of the issue that we have here is we're dealing with history, uh, history where uh, black women were either hypersexualized uh, and, and, you know, just available for, for whoever wanted to have them and black women who are feared. And it's kind of been that tension in society all along while you have white, uh, the white beauty industry trying to take advantage of that. I mean, I'm old enough to remember Bo Derek having braids, you know, when people thought that was scandalous because she was co-opting a black style, a cultural style. And we've gone from there to having Adele with Bantu braids, uh, uh, Bantu knots rather. And it just, infuriates me the fact that we really can't get this right even after 400 and some odd years. So uh, kudos to Chloe for, for trying to stand up to this kind of negativity, but it can have an impact. It will have an impact and you don't know that impact until these young women become of age. And so we have to do the best as black men and as, as, as men in general to make sure that that doesn't happen and to understand that black women are beautiful and that they will be beautiful, they always have been, and there is no question ab about that at all in my mind. Uh, again, that was critically important. And, and I just want us to understand uh, that if you, if you want to disagree with Chloe Bailey doing a video in her underwear on Instagram, fine. Okay, whatever. That's fine. But what you're not going to do is condemn how she looks. You're not going to condemn beauty. You're not going to create the doubt because I think we need to understand there are a lot of black women who have grown up in this country who have been told, not just by peers, but by family members, that they are ugly, that they are not beautiful, that their hair is not quality, uh, that their features are not good. And so, I mean, just, and look, and, and, and here's the piece. Social media changes. And look, we all, we all say things and we might crack jokes and we might do things along those lines. We do have to understand that there is a significant difference in America in the policing of black women's bodies. 
We need to understand that that is real and not something that we can simply ignore. All right, folks, back to our Mark Unfiltered video in just one moment. It's time to be smart. When we control our institutions, we win. We win. This is the most important news show on television of any racial background. Y'all put two, three, four, five, 10, 15, 20, 30 dollars on this and keep this going. What you've done, Roland, since this crisis came out in full bloom. Anybody watching this, tell your friends, go back and look at the last two weeks, especially of Roland Martin Unfiltered. I mean, hell, go back and look at the last two days. You've had sitting United States senators today, Klobuchar and Harris. Whatever you have that you have, you can bring to Roland Martin Unfiltered to support it, please do, because this information may literally save your life. Watch Roland Martin Unfiltered daily at 6 p.m. Eastern on YouTube, Facebook, or Periscope, or go to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Support the Roland Martin Unfiltered Daily Digital Show by going to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. You want to support Roller Martin Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real as Roller Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roller Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to RollerMartinUnfiltered.com. You can make this possible. We don't play footsie here. No. Okay. See, you, you, can't, you can't sit here and talk about I care about all constituents and uh, uh, Joe Biden, you know, you're not really practicing unity. You're not doing these things. And I'm like, no, hold, hold up. Y'all supporting that. See, y you can't sit here, Kevin McCarthy, give a speech on the floor, mm. calling Trump out for his role in the insurrection. But then you vote against the impeachment. Mm -hmm. Then you fly your ass down to Florida <laughs> and take a picture with him. That's right. As because really what you're saying is, I I I I know what I said on the floor was one thing. <laughs> but 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 the picture says I, I'm I'm really with him. Mm -hmm. See, that, that's why that's why when, when I was with David, David was like, well, do, do, do you not accept her, uh, uh, her, her apology? I'm like, hell no. Y'all go ahead and take this. <laughs> take this. Action to that from Roland Martin, a host and managing editor of Roland Martin Unfiltered. Roland, great to have you back on the show. Great to be back. What's happening? All right, well, we got a lot happening, and, and but I want to play, we're going to play in a moment some of Marjorie Taylor Greene's comments on the House floor first, but I want to get your overall view of Democrats taking this vote, because this is unprecedented for, for a Democrat, for an opposition party to say, we're not having any of this. Well, if the Republicans had done their job, this wouldn't be left up to Democrats. Uh, that was the problem there. This is an absolutely crazy and deranged woman. That's who she is. And so, sure, her crazy constituents in Georgia elected her, but so did those fools in Iowa who elected Steve King. Republicans took the steps against him. But when you look at not just her... Com See, Kevin McCarthy, oh, but her comments before. No, no, no. It's what she has said shit since she's been there. And then I, I, I really get a kick out of folk who have a long track record of comments, and all of a sudden, oh, I denounced what I said. Hell, you said it! Yeah, but, okay, but, Roland, here's the thing. We can, we can play the duplicity card. I mean, can I bring up Ilan Omar? Can I bring up Maxine Waters? Can I bring up some folks that have said some try crazy it. stuff, too? Some crazy stuff, too. Try it. Try I, it. But also, did any of them try to lead an insurrection? Did any of them tweet 1776? I, did any of them talk about that? I'm just, Marjorie Greene cannot be trusted as a member of Congress, pure okay. and simple. And here's the deal. Do the rules allow for this to happen? Yes, they do. Republicans supposedly like playing by the rules, right? Roland, I want you to listen to Marjorie Taylor Greene. She was on the House floor today. We're going to all watch it together. Here it is. And I want you to know... A all lot right, of so I played, I, 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 I played that, and I'm going to let that go ahead uh, and play. Uh, Y'all get ready to go back. 
when y'all see when y'all see us come back, just going back. Uh, but and again, I, I like David, and I get it. He's speaking to his uh, his right audience. But I'm gonna bring that heat so they can actually hear the truth. And I'm mm -hmm. not playing that that look that that look that look again that look Christian love game that she thought. I mean, I, I'm the wrong one. Mm -mm, no, nah, boo. That 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 dog don't hunt where I come from. Uh, it, it, it's just not gonna work. <laughs> and see, and, and, and let's just be real clear, you got too many folk on mainstream TV who's scared to say it, who's scared to actually go there, who don't want to mm. truly call out white Christianity, who don't want to call out white nationalism, they want to use all the other words and phrases uh, around it. Mm -hmm. Nah, see, we're not gonna sit here uh, and dance around it. We're gonna call this thing exactly what it is, and they have to get checked uh, they have to get called out, and it's not just folk like her. It is Marco Rubio. It is Jim. Uh, can y'all keep that thing down about wrestlers being sexually assaulted, Jordan? Mm. Uh, it's all the rest of these folk uh, who want to play uh, all of these games. And see, we're going to do a roll call. Because, see, I'm telling you, Greg said it. I've been telling y'all, it's only two lines. Either you were with the folks on January 6th or you with the rest of us. See, w w w w w we ain't going to play hopscotch. Yes, yeah, ain't gonna hop right. over here. They come over here. They come over here. You, I, I don't want to hear you talking about unity. If you stand with those thugs, those white domestic terrorists, mm -hmm. or even the confused, yeah. ignorant black folks and other dark-skinned folks who were with them, then you know what? Are you, you, you as well. Go back to David Brody. Roland, Roland don't laugh. None of no. us are perfect. I'm a sinner. Words of the past. It was a mea culpa. It was a mea culpa. It was an apology. That's what you're going to get. That, that's pretty good. That's pretty good, Roland. Roland. You, you, you actually fell for that? You, you what? actually. Well, I look, mean, look, so, so look, now we're not I, supposed look, to believe I, anybody? I, look, I, do you actually believe what she just said? Listen, I, I, you I, believe? Was led astray, I was led astray by things at the time that I didn't realize were not true. Now I have seen the light. And now they are true. Rowan, is she Bro, the first person in the world on. to do a mea culpa? She's not the first person to do I'm, a mea culpa. But no, no, no. I understand the difference between a mea culpa and then somebody who's like, yeah, I need to save my behind. I still believe that stuff, but I got to so say So Democrats, right Democrats have never done that? I mean, come on. Liberals, liberals haven't nothing, done that? I believe nothing that she just said. Nothing. And then I'm a, love, I'm a lover of Jesus Christ. I'm a... Come on, don't, David. David. Wait, Roland, don't get know. on her faith now. You're starting to condemn her faith David. now. No, 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 I'm not. Because first of all, David, you got to remember who you're talking to. The husband of an ordained minister. A Christian yeah, author. So, so. I, also, I also understand when theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer talked about cheap grace. Yeah, but you okay? don't know her. You, talk, you, you don't know her. You don't know no, her. No, 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 no. Here's, here's what I, again. You don't know see, her. See, again, if we want to have a Christian conversation, the theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer talked about those people who have cheap grace, who do things and they go, oh, Lord, forgive me. They go back to doing these things. I, all, I Here's judge my Marjorie Taylor Greene. Hold up. I judge her based upon what she has said since she got elected. And she has hey. said absolutely crazy, outrageous things. Not 2018. Hey. 2020, 2021. Roland, straight up. Liberals always talk about compassion for your fellow man, and then and then you got th this going on. Look, why can't we have some compassion for her? I mean, in other, when I say oh, compassion, no, no, I, forgiveness, no, no, no. forgiveness. What compassion. about forgiveness? Here's the deal. I can have compassion All right. and still remove still remove your behind from your committees. And then in <laughs> six months, and no, no, no. In six months, when we actually see if you've actually changed, then they can be restored. But but see, here's the deal. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. can't do all the things she said and done in the past few months, including January 6th, and then go, oh, I'm sorry. Lord, forgive me. No, nah, boo. That's well, not how it works. Listen, no, Roland, I disagree with you. She can say that and then show in the future if she doesn't make the same mistake, if you will. But the point, nah. but, but she can say it. She can say it. She can say it. Here's the deal. Democrats take the action, and in six months, if she actually shows what she just talked about, they can always restore. So can you'd be for that. Can you'd that be, happen? You'd be for that. You'd be for her restore, getting the committee assignments back if she showed true contrition. If she shows it, but let's see what she says and does for the next six months. I don't trust that she actually can we, be humbled and not act a fool for the next six months. But sure, let's see what happens. What? Snatch the committee right now.
Will you at least acknowledge that this is not just a conservative QAnon issue? This is the liberals do this on the other side, too. Everybody's got their baggage, uh, Roland. Everybody's got their no, no, baggage. No, no. Individuals have their baggage. Yes, yes. And here's, and here's the deal. And here's the deal. This is real simple, okay? Mm -hmm. I, I, all I heard for the last four years from Republicans yeah. is that winning, uh, right. you actually have the spoils of victory. Well, guess what? Yeah. What happens when you win? Roland Martin. I'm going to say this on national television. I love you, and there's no air quotes around that. You know that. I appreciate that. it. I, I... See, I ain't making excuses for these folks. You're a better man than I am. <laughs> see, you know, see, uh, see, my deal is I knew exactly. See, again, <laughs> game recognized game. See, they, they, they love, because see, here's the deal. Here's the deal. They want you to go chase that rabbit hole. Democrats said this. This is me. Mm-mm. Mm -mm, we, ain't, we ain't going there. Mm -mm. Nope. What, nope. We ain't going there. We ain't going there. We're going to stay right here. See, Erica, that, that's the real deal here. And see, and what I need folk to understand is, again, it's only two sides now. If you align in any way with them white domestic terrorists on January 6th, you are my mm. enemy. You mm. are my people's enemy. We, we, mm. we, we ain't sitting here. But, and that's why I was like, all right. Mm -hmm. All them words, I'm a wife, I'm a mother. Let me see what you do for the next six months. My but here's what we already know. She's already sent a fundraising appeal lying on AOC. Yep. Yep. So, Heffa, you already showed me who you are. Come on. You already raising money and you lied on AOC in your fundraising appeal. That's why snatch your committee. Yeah, and snatch your wig while you're at it. Um, I got to give a shout out to Greg. He gave me my life back in a text message just that quickly because it, it, it you, you personalized this, right? Um, it, it just really the apologist kind of narrative that continues to flow out of uh, a whiteness. But this is why we have to stay vigilant. You know, I know you've already discussed this um, on the show earlier this week, but we're thinking about, you know, the lack of grace, the lack of understanding that was not given to a nine-year-old black child in Rochester, mm. New York. And so mm. we see how there's always a runway, right, for whiteness <clears throat> to be considered uh, otherwise, to um, you don't know what's in their heart. Well, you know, the Bible clearly says the heart is, is, is vile. It's, it's full of <laughs> things that are not pleasing <laughs> unto God. So, you know, scratch that, like throw that all the way out of the window. We know who she is because she told us who she was. She told us who she was when she was running for office. And when she got into office, she continued to tell us who she was. She said that she engaged in politics because she was drawn by the son of a Klansman. And I continue to say he's the son of a Klansman because we okay. have to always go back to what the Klans, uh, what the Klan uh, was founded on. And Dr. Carr laid it out for us. They were founded on some type of Christian um, belief system, but it was not, it's not a belief system that extends to all people. It is very much so narrow and centers and upholds and, and makes sure that the, the uh, supremacy is always with whiteness. Everyone else is there to serve whiteness. And so as we think about this and as we continue to hear the media talk about her um, ad nauseum, as we continue to hear QAnon become more mainstream, that we continue to hold true to who she and the Republican Party is. What we saw on January the 6th is really the outflow of what the natives and what black people have experienced in this very nation by white uh -oh. mobs. It has always been like this for us. It has That's always right. been like this for natives. We are the ones who built this damn thing. So understand that Marjorie Green ain't shit, but another uh, copy out of this whole um, prototype of how you aggressively attack, oppress, suppress, all voices that are non-white. That is all it is. And so if there cannot be um, some type of courage gained by the Democrats out, outflowed from all of the black folk, 90% um, of black people, excuse me, of black women, 80% of black men that made their way to the polls to make sure that they were in power in the, <laughs> in the, the White House, uh, in both chambers of Congress, then we have a real issue here. What, we got see, the wrong people in power. Sorry, folks, back to that Roland Martin video in just one moment. It's time to be smart. 
When we control our institutions, we win. We win. This is the most important news show on television of any racial background. Y'all put two, three, four, five, ten, fifteen, twenty, thirty dollars on this and keep this going. What you've done, Roland, since this crisis came out in full bloom. Anybody watching this, tell your friends. Go back and look at the last two weeks, especially of Roland Martin Unfiltered. I mean, hell, go back and look at the last two days. You've had sitting United States senators today, Klobuchar and Harris. Whatever you have that you have, you can bring to Roland Martin Unfiltered to support it. Please do, because this information may literally save your life. Watch Roland Martin Unfiltered daily at 6 p.m. Eastern on YouTube, Facebook, or Periscope, or go to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Support the Roland Martin Unfiltered Daily Digital Show by going to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. You want to support Roland Martin Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real as Roland Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roland Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. You can make this possible. As President Joe Biden does not have his United Nations ambassador yet because... Senator Ted Cruz has been an ass. Last week, uh, the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, they actually chose to delay the vote on United Nations Ambassador appointee Linda Thomas-Greenfield. Why? Because Ted Cruz did not like a speech that she gave at Savannah State University in 2019. Thomas-Greenfield gave the speech at the Chinese-funded Confucius Institute on campus regarding China's relations and investments in Africa. Now, although she says she regrets her comments, Cruz and several other GOP senators rehashed the speech and questioned Thomas Greenfield's approach on the threat of China. The committee is slated to reconvene uh, to reconsider her role. Now, here is this fool, Ted Cruz. Watch this. So you have said you were horrified by seeing firsthand what the Confucius Institute was doing. Did you keep the money? Uh, I can tell you what I did with the money. Uh, I give a tremendous amount of my very meager resources to humanitarian efforts. And so you did keep did. the money, though? You, you did. didn't give it back? I, I did. I did not give it back. It was not from the Confucius Institute. It was from Savannah State University. Now, you also described, you said you've spoken out against China's abusive practices. Um, perhaps you have elsewhere, uh, but I can tell you I'm holding the speech you gave at the Confucius Institute and I can't find a single word of criticism in this speech. This speech is cheerleading for the Chinese Communist Party. You praise the Belt and Road Initiative. You praise their entrapping developing countries uh, in debt bondage. And you say the United States should follow China's model. Is it the role of America's UN ambassador to be cheering on the Chinese Communist Party at the expense of the developing world and at the expense of America? Uh, Senator, it was not my intention, uh, nor I, do I think that I cheered on the uh, Chinese Communist Party. Uh, what I recommended in that speech is that Africans need to open their eyes on how they deal with the Chinese. And I would like to see the United States government do more in Africa to compete with uh, the my, my, my final question, did, did you have even a word of criticism about the Chinese Communist Party, about its murders, about its tortures, about its concentration camps, about its genocide? Did you have even a word of criticism in the speech you gave at the Confucius Institute? Uh, I spoke about human rights there. Uh, that's the speech, but you don't see my other engagements uh, with students who ask questions that I answered frankly. And uh, I don't ignore human rights. I talk about the fact that Africans like but, but our But in the speech, did you address human rights? Uh, I did. Human rights is referred to as something that we promote in the United States. That what did you say about human rights? That speech? are our values. W what did you say? I, about I mean, in my discussions with, uh, with Africans. But, but the I speech appreciate didn't what have you're anything. saying. I'm not denying this. As I said, I regret this. I, you know, this is one speech in my 35-year career, and I do regret that speech, but if you look at what I have done prior to that, there is no question that I understand I am not 
at all naive about what the Chinese are doing. And I have called them out on a regular ba basis, including today. Thank you. Sir Nicole Booker, New Jersey, did not quite like Ted Cruz keep harping on this speech at the HBCU. And he had her back. So good to see you uh, here Thank today. You. I, I uh, watched the whole um, hearing on, on uh, my television in my office and uh, was really appreciative with, with generous spirit on both sides of the aisle and the substance of the question. I, I did hear one colleague, though, uh, refer to Biden administration's uh, nominees as embracing China. I think was that, that was the exact wording. And I found that just patently unfair and untrue. And then I heard one speech being taken in a way that was patently offensive to me at a moment that we just had a siege on the Capitol. And I would actually say that of all the members here of this committee, there's not one that doesn't have something in a speech in their past that they regret doing, as this person has said, especially at a time that we see people whipped up to storm a Capitol and the perpetuation of baseless lies that an election that was won by 7 million votes was a fraud. And so I'm, I'm particularly galled <laughs> that in the spirit of bipartisanship, which we usually have, that you were uh, treated like you were recently about one speech that you had already thoroughly explained to numerous members. And the generosity of some of my friends on the other side of the aisle was pointed very clearly. You were invited to give a speech by an HBCU. Now, some of my colleagues might not know this. I have buckets of invitations of speeches where I get speech invitations that I prioritize. If you're a New Jersey University, you got me. <laughs> if you are one of my alma maters, you got me. But when I get a call from an HBCU, I would imagine to the nominee, you know the sacred importance of HBCUs. You know that they are the number one producer in America of black generals, number one producer in America of black doctors, number one producer in America of black professors, PhDs, and so forth. In fact, if there is a hope for this country ever to reach equality in all the ranks of all the professions, would you agree with me that the HBCUs are still that hope? Without a doubt, Senator, thank yeah. you very much. Yes, and, and as a person who is the, has two generations before me going to HBCUs, the fact that you accepted an invitation from a black college to give a speech, to me, shows that you have the right priority list. Because I will tell you this, our State Department ranks are woefully lacking in African Americans. When I travel the globe and visit embassies, they are woefully lacking. We are now at a period where we've had a, a black vice president, first woman as well, first woman treasurer, you are one of the generations of women that are breaking down barriers and showing the way for women and African Americans. I, I imagine your commitment to continue to do that is the same, yes. Absolutely. Now, the other thing that just galled me a little bit, it was the fact that Senator Menendez, my senior senator, who is friend and mentor to me, read a whole list through your research, Senator Menendez, of examples for I think 10 to 20 years of you being a canary in the coal mine making warnings about China, China's activities in Africa. And so to the Senator Menendez, who I rarely ever tell him what to do, so I'll ask him, could you introduce that litany into the record in a formal way so that it is there forever? I'd be happy to. Thank you very much. So I just want you to know I am celebrating that you are sitting before me right now because I know the challenges we still have in this country. And I watched after George Floyd was savagely murdered, how it wasn't just all 50 states of America that came out and protested, but we saw other nations, right? At least a dozen other countries, because they know that the United States of America, if we can make our values true here, there's hope for the world. Would you agree with that? Yes, sir. So I, I have 30 seconds left, and I apologize for using all my time, uh, but I just want you to know, for my ancestors, for communities of color all around the world who wonder if this nation will ever achieve itself, will ever get to a point where we can be a country where we celebrate the richness of our diversity, not just in words, 
but in positions of leadership where we achieve our potential, as past generations saw when they brought hidden figures out of the shadows and sat them together with NASA astronauts and literally defied gravity, that you today, sitting in that seat, are a reason to rejoice. And your record is unapproachable in your patriotism to this country under Democratic uh, uh, and Republican administrations. I thank you, I celebrate you, and I will submit my questions for the record in hopes that you will give me that response. I yield to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. So, Michael, here's why I am greatly, greatly bothered here. Um, the first thing is the, the Americans love to talk smack about China and how we're so concerned about what China is doing in Africa. And Thomas Greenfield said, I would like to see America do more. I remember when Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State and she was cautioning African nations about accepting money for investment for China. And I'm sitting here going, well, it ain't like the United States is coming to the table with $100 billion for Chinese nations. Now, let me be real clear. I am not defending how the Chinese, in many cases, have raped African nations. Right. But when other countries are coming with nothing, you're basically saying to African nations, hey, y'all on your own. They're going to cut those deals with China. And so, Cruz, show me where you want to put a bill forth for the United States to invest in African nations. It's not going to happen, Michael. Uh, I don't think... Uh Ted Cruz is doing that. And I think Ted Cruz is just trying to be an obstructionist. Okay. I think he's just trying to be an obstructionist, but you know, is, is, is not see Ted Cruz is a, is a very um, interesting, but unlikable person at the same time, because <laughs> this is, this is, the, this is the guy who more like Donald than he Trump is insulted his wife, Donald Trump insulted his wife. Right. And, but then Ted Cruz, continues to carry Donald Trump's water. And Ted Cruz was at the Stop the Steal rally January 6th inciting the insurrectionists. He was there. So, you know, I I'm glad you showed Senator Cory Booker putting everything in the context. And really, it was a underhanded backhand slap at Ted Cruz also with what, uh, what uh, uh, Senator Cory Booker was saying as well. But, you know, t t Ted Cruz is, you know, he was reelected... Um, uh, I think two was it two years ago? Two years, yeah, yeah it was in uh, 2018. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, beat uh, like, beat right. uh, one, one by uh, two point five, one by two point five points uh, right. against uh, uh, Beto O'Rourke. Right. So he had he has four years. He has four years left, and I think maybe it's a good chance after that insurrection that took place. I think maybe it's a good chance that they could get him out of. Uh, uh, getting him out of that Senate seat, but yeah, Ted, Ted Cruz is in he, Ted Cruz is in no position to try to take the moral authority on this and try to check that sister like that. No, no, he's not. For me, Rob is where it's problematic. Where again, if you're the United States and you want to talk trash about what some other country is doing and their influence on African nations, step the hell up. I mean, yep. those African nations are more than happy uh, to accept uh, investment from from America, but. You can't talk trash about somebody else and then you do nothing. Yeah, it's actually reminiscent of some of our past, you know, when uh, African nations had to rely on Cuba, the Soviet Union, you know, South Africa just to survive. And people were saying, well, why didn't Nelson Mandela and all those people accept help? Because they were in, they were in a fight for their freedom. They don't care what, right. what the nations call themselves. It's about making sure they survive. Africa, same thing. So, I mean, it's so easy to criticize these nations, but I find it really, really hypocritical. Second, as we're talking about hypocrites, I want to just, I want to talk about Ted Cruz because this man just defended, he, he was defending a whole philosophy we, we know to be false. If you got a chance to see this, uh, uh, this uh, 
lawsuit that was filed by Dominion, the voting machine. It's just, it's just such a great line. Right. Uh, it's one of the best openings. It says, you know, the earth is round, two plus two equals four. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are president of the United States. These are facts. They're undisputed. The election wasn't rigged. It's just as true as the earth being round, two plus two equals four. But you have people like Ted Cruz promoting this propaganda, getting people riled up, believing that things are being taken from him, uh, that, 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 that the nation was rigged, that they have something to fight for. He is just as responsible for, uh, as Trump because he's in, he empowered that rhetoric. He's still not going to hold them accountable. So I don't want to hear anything from a lot of these people. They, they've lost their right to any type of moral high ground to me for a very long time. I don't want to hear it. I, and, and that's really for me right there, Amisha. I don't want to hear a damn thing from Ted Cruz or any of these people because also I don't want to hear you even having the audacity, the unmitigated goal uh, to question uh, China and their human rights abuses when you literally were going to, you were supporting people who wanted to overthrow this country. That's, no, that, that's treason. Ted, that's, tra that's being a Ted traitor. Cruz. Ted Cruz has been an echo chamber for QAnon conspiracy theories for a long time now. He stood out and he helped to not only amplify their voices, but he also pushed those conspiracy theories that he himself knew were false because they helped Republicans fundraise. He also did it because it allowed for the, the outgrowth of those rallies and pushing people out. And, and like you said, the insurrection that we saw just a few weeks ago. Ted Cruz also cannot personally speak to or engage in any level about humanitarian crises. This is the same guy who voted for and supported President Trump as he pulled out of um, various treaties that we've had with country with, with nations that we relied upon, not only in terms of fighting for you know humanitarian efforts globally, but also in terms of uh, funding. I think that it's very upsetting when we see someone like Ted Cruz speak against um, speak against a nominee who happens to be a black woman. And I think that this is largely because she would be first and she is a black woman. Let's not forget this is also Black History Month, so it's a double slap in the face. But this is uh, the same Ted Cruz Cruz, who himself has again stood by while America pilfered the resources of various African nations. This is the same Ted Cruz who stood by and voted for the United States pulling out of humanitarian regards for various countries in Africa. So no, he doesn't care about Africa. He also does not, this is a Republican talking point, all things China, 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 China. And they're trying to link in any given way something that can dissuade, um, that can dissuade voters who do not understand that Democrats have no true alliance to China. I think that somebody accepting a speech, because Republicans, if we pull out the docket, Republicans have spoken everywhere for private sector organizations. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, you swear, <laughs> you, I mean, you, you swear Biden and Hillary, like Democrats in love with China. First of all, how many of these Republicans are doing business in China? How many of them? Himself. How many of them are selling their products Trump there? Himself. How many? His they, daughter has I mean, contracts. Right. right. I'm like, y'all, come on now. They made a bunch of. Yep. I mean, they're all full of it. They're all full of it. They're just such great marketers, though. What I what I have to give Republicans is they know how to market some shit, boy. They can make up some stuff and make people believe it, and they just make it up. I guess they have to be because their policies are so bad. But the, boy, we need to take a class in their marketing because they know how to do this. They really do. Yeah, no, they they they, they real good with the line. They real good with the line. <laughs> every single night. We've got some of the top black experts. You're not gonna see them on cable news or broadcast news because you swear black people aren't experts when it comes to this health crisis. That's why we have this show and why we do what we do every day on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Joining us right now is retired General Russell Honore. Uh, thanks for first black surgeon general, Dr. Jocelyn Elders, John Hope Bryan. He is the founder of Operation Hope. Senator Kamala Harris of California, Dr. Sadrina Calder, retired General Lloyd Austin, Congresswoman Karen Bass, Commissioner Omari Hardy, Bureau President in Brooklyn, Eric Adams, Dr. Joseph Graves, America's Wealth Coach, Deborah Owens, Dr. Corey A. Bear, Patel Salt. Uh, Howard University student, Pastor Jamal Bryant, a uh, doctor, uh, Christy McDowell, Benja Ajilore, senior economist at the Center for American Progress, Gilda Daniels, again, author of the book, The Crisis of Voter Suppression in America. Four stars, uh, General Kip Ward, Dr. Oliver Brooks, is president of the National Medical Association, president of the American Medical Association, Dr. Patrice Harris, Joby Benjamin, Dr. Alexia Gaffney, infectious disease specialist, Dr. George's Benjamin, uh, executive director of the American, American Public Health Association, Malcolm Nance, family medicine, Physician Dr. Jen Caudle, Dr. Tashaka Cunningham, a molecular biologist, Cat Staff.
Schaefer. She's a national race and ethnicity reporter for the Associated Press. Dr. Wayne A. I. Frederick, uh, who is the president of Howard University, Congresswoman Yvette Clark uh, from the state of New York, William Springs, AFL-CIO economist, uh, Andrea James, executive director of the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. All right, let's go to Capitol Hill. Congressman Gregory Meeks, Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson of Texas, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, Minnesota Senior and Amy Klobuchar, mental health clinician, Jamie Singletary, Prince George's County State's Attorney, Aisha Brave Boy, as well as Dylan uh, Harry, ACLU Justice Division Strategist. Uh, Dr. Cindy Duke, uh, she is a virologist, Principal Steve Perry of Capital Prep. Health and wellness specialist, Dr. Yolandra Hancock, Desmond Mead, President of the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition, Cliff Albright, who is the co-founder of Black Voters Matter, Michael Harriet with the group, the Mina McWhorter, founder of Love by the Hand, Dr. Julian Malvo, economist, president, Emerita Bennett College, coroner Michael Fowler, is the mayor of Atlanta, Keisha Lance Bottoms, mental health therapist, Suzette Clark, Justin Gibney, attorney and political strategist, and Bishop Vincent Matthews, Jr., Dr. Suzette McKinney, CEO and executive director of the Illinois Medical District, Dr. Leon Madugal, president-elect of the National Medical Association, Jana Bailey, Mayor of Moss Point, uh, Mississippi, uh, Mario King. We're going to keep driving this thing to make sure our people are fully aware, safe, protected from coronavirus. You get the top medical experts, the top business experts, top political experts, top religious experts, because that's why we do what we do unapologetically and unfiltered. Ain't nobody else in the black media space doing what we do. Watch Roland Martin Unfiltered daily at 6 p.m. Eastern on YouTube, Facebook, or Periscope or go to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Support the Roland Martin Unfiltered Daily Digital Show by going to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. You want to support Roland Martin Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real as Roland Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roland Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. We told you that uh, the folks at CBS, they have... Uh, put on administrative leave two of their executives uh, who were accused of using racist, sexist, and homophobic comments. One of the issues they've also had to deal with is uh, employees saying that they were being unfairly paid uh, for their work as well. This has been uh, an issue, and lawsuit was actually filed on, on this very point. Uh, that, uh, and in fact, remember we had. Um, uh, we had a, a former CBS employee last week who was on who talked about Don Champion. Uh, his, how, his whole livelihood was based on whether or not he would, uh, of course, get assignments uh, when he was a, a freelancer. And so um, what was, was interesting about this is that uh, a former freelancer uh, is suing, the, suing, of course, uh, CBS. Uh, and the station is based in Fort Lauderdale, WFOR Channel 4. She claims the station engaged in wage discrimination as well as gender discrimination. OK, so uh, let's talk about this right now with Sylvia uh, Harper. She and also Peter uh, uh, Hugo, who is her attorney as well. Folks, how you doing? Very well. All right. Let's let's Sylvia. So uh, lay out for us first the basis of your uh, lawsuit because uh, we've heard others uh, uh, again Don Champion talked about again the executives if they didn't like him that determined whether or not he got money you know whether he would get assignments uh, and we've heard others uh, I'm the vice president of digital for the National Association of Black Journalists we've heard others talk about how um, the use of freelancers uh, was keeping folks from being able to to earn a living, and some people were freelancing for more than a decade. Yeah, it's a, it's a problem that you don't realize is so widespread because you're so, as a journalist, focused on doing your job and making sure that you do it so well so that you get called back. So this idea of creating instability in your life and put you in a survival mode so that you don't necessarily question what's going on around you. I worked at CBS Miami for seven years. I was praised and promoted 
only by title. Um, and in those seven years, job openings came and went, and I was never offered a full-time position. Other people were hired, and when I asked about it, I was told the position isn't available to you. And when I was asked about a raise potentially on my day rate, I was asked, I was told that the money isn't available to you. Um, and this went on for seven years. And you don't think to ask because, well, this is what we want to do, and we we do it because this is what we love. This is our dream. But seven years is a long time. And when I think back, there were so many people that were working as, as freelancers, writers, producers, assignment desk editors, all of us for more than three years at a time, uh, some people for a decade. And to be honest with you, I, I am nervous being here, even though I, I took legal action and uh, my attorney's joining on this call. I, I, it, it's scary because the way CBS has managed um, from the top down, uh, it trickles down into the local newsroom. And the message was always very clear. Speak up or put it in writing or um, ask questions, go to HR or business department. The consequences are severe. The bullying and the retaliation is severe. Uh, you're either not going to be scheduled or you, um, uh, if you are, you're not going to get the assignments that, that, that you rightfully have worked for or deserve. Um, I've spoken to dozens of people out of WCBS, KPEX, out of, um, out of KCBS. Some people were fired and let go because they asked questions about their time cards. And the issue is that CBS blatantly and bluntly told all of us to write a flat eight hours on our time cards, regardless of whether we worked for more than eight or not. So when you think about it, if I'm covering a hurricane, which I did on multiple occasions, and I'm working 18 hours for five, six days in a row, I'm getting a flat rate of eight hours day pay. And when that happens over and over again, the economic disparities and the difficulties are, are, are very difficult to overcome. Personally, I, and this is embarrassing to admit on some level, but I could no longer afford my car to, to make my car payment. So I had to turn my lease in and I had to buy a scooter to get to work. I've talked to several people out of WCBS. There was a person who was getting paid $80 a day in New York. $80 a day. And how are you supposed to survive? And when you hear these stories, and I hear these stories because after the lawsuit, dozens of people have called me and have told me their stories. And you hear them over and over again, you realize you're not the only one who was passed over for a job. You're not the only one who was put in that kind of position. So I thought it was extremely important to speak up and stand up and do something about it. Peter, um, uh, share with us, you know, what you learned because uh, what, what 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 Silva's laying out, I mean, is is just is shocking and, and stunning, and uh, you know, eighty bucks in New York City, uh, you know, if you, Jesus, that's ten dollars an hour, for eight well, hours, and if you're working 10, 12, 14 hours, but you're only getting paid for eight. Well, the uh, contention of CBS has been <clears throat> throughout the litigation that these uh, independent television stations are operated uh, with uh, collective bargaining agreements. In Silva's case, there was no collective bargaining agreement through an organi organization that uh, is SAG-AFTRA. And the SAG-AFTRA union contracts uh, have been negotiated, uh, but frequently uh, there is a per diem rate and the stations are uh, somewhat different uh, in, in how they approach their day rate. Uh, for example, uh, uh, the uh, KCBS Los Angeles, their anchors are paid a day rate. Uh, in Miami, I think Silva was only paid $210 uh, for a day uh, for an extended period of time. Um, and this certainly creates issues. We have advanced her lawsuit under the Fair Labor Standards Act and the Equal Pay Act, uh, alleging uh, violations of, of both of these statutes and also Title VII uh, for uh, gender discrimination and age discrimination. Uh, and a lot of the people that I have spoken 
two uh, who have come forward as witnesses are scared uh, because of the retaliation that they may face, of fear of being blackballed in the industry. And uh, so presently we have a motion pending before the court to see if we can allow, the, if these people would be allowed to proceed anonymously, which is a novel concept. Uh, but when you're dealing with uh, such a big entity, uh, the repercussions of speaking up are, are palpable. That point right there, Silva, is the, and that is the fear. The fear, if I sue, I'm going to be um, blackballed. Um, you, how has this impacted your career and ability to work? I mean, the consequences are severe. There is a cost to this. And I mean, I haven't worked uh, in this industry for since 2018. And uh, to be honest since with you. Since 2018? 2018, yeah. And anywhere any and anywhere uh, and the reality is even when i was working at cbs i applied for other jobs but you know what the question is is why have you been working at at, at the station for seven years as a freelancer why have why were you not made a full-time employee uh, in, insinuating that there is some backstory or some other reason why i was not hired so this perception that there must be something there, not realizing that this is just a cost cutting measure at the expense of the people who who literally show up on a daily basis and do the work of six people in a newsroom. You know, as an employee at CBS, I produced stories for other people to voice in front. I showed up to report on a daily basis. So five days a week, sometimes six in a row. And then I write for digital and then I do social media and then I write for the magazine. All of that is not an eight hour job. It, it And to be truthful, you know, I put my entire life in this business. I was born in the Middle East. I got to this country when I was 14 years old. I learned to speak English in soft, uh, as a sophomore in high school. And to think that I have put everything I have had into building a career and trying to move up the ladder the right way and to end up in a situation where I have to make a decision between the career I've built and my integrity as a journalist. because. How could I ever ask anyone in the street to put their to, to risk their life, to put their livelihood on the line, to put their face on camera to tell a story when I can't even do that in my own life? So I I just I grappled and struggled with the integrity of being a journalist. And the 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 cost has been Sorry. I understand. Take your time. Take your time. Sorry. And the reality of it is since the news broke and this has ma been made public and let me just go back and say, I tried to address this with management at the local level. And because of the way this leadership with the two people that now are administrative leave, the way they've emboldened and encouraged leadership on the local level to be, the, there are no consequences, right, to their actions. So this trickle down effect is real. So people are walking on eggshells. People who worked at CBS a decade ago are, I've talked to them in person and I've got names and stories dating back a decade ago and they're still afraid to come forward and tell their stories because of the fear of retaliation. And the reality is it's not enough to hold those two people accountable. We have to address this trickle down effect on the local level where management is able to get away with anything. You know, part of the reason I came forward and that is because I tried to address this with, with my manager. And then after I left in 2018, I did file a complaint during that investigation and nothing happened. I filed an EEOC complaint, but really the, the, the last thing that happened to me was that as a reporter, I was sent on assignment and I was sexually assaulted on assignment. And when my complaints were and concerns were ignored by the manager who sent me to that assignment, which was, and Roland, you can appreciate this, to go cover a story at the public parking lot 
of a football game at the Dolphin Stadium, where for 13 hours, people have been tailgating and drinking and to do a live shot at 11 o'clock. And when I addressed my concerns to be put in that kind of circumstance, I was told, are you refusing to do your job? And seconds before a, a live shot, I, I, my ass is smacked, I'm groped and touched inappropriately. And when I complain, and again, I'm told, are you trying to say you, you're refusing to do your job? And sent back to the same circumstances for the second time three weeks later. And when I finally took it to my female news director, her response to that kind of environment was, to stop complaining and to stop whining. When you have a culture, a toxic environment and toxic culture that allows for that kind of behavior and that kind of management to deal with issues on that level, then it makes you kind of wonder, what am I doing here for $210 a day without a car and working 18 hours? And to think that there are hundreds of people who've gone through this organization and have experienced exactly, well, not exactly the same thing I did, but very close. And I can't even pretend to understand what my black and brown journalist brothers and sisters go through. You heard John, Don Champion's story. And when you look at the Excel spreadsheet Peter and I have, where we continue to talk to people from CBS, from several, for all, from all of the different stations across the country, and they repeat exactly the same stories and the same MO, the being bullied, retaliated against, uh, if they spoke of. People have lost their jobs, people have lost their livelihoods, and 95% of those people are women older, the, uh, above the age of 40, there are people of color, and there are people of members of the LGBTQT community. And you can't turn your face from that kind of circumstance. And if it's one person, then you have a disgruntled employee, but you have hundreds of people with the same story, you have a problem, you have a cultural problem. I'm hopeful that they have been put on administrative leave and that the powers that be are, are trying to change things. And this independent investigation has been launched, but I'm gonna be honest with you, I've, I've gotten calls from almost everyone on that list and everyone is still afraid to speak to people who are leading this independent investigation. So the fear and the and 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 impact on our careers, it, it runs deep and it's important to know that our lives have changed. My life may never be the same again. For 20 years, I built a career that I was hopeful to just show up to work and to do my job. And that may never happen for me again. But how could I ever ask someone else to put their life on the line to be a witness or to tell their story if I'm not willing to do the same for myself? Peter, final comment. Well, I mean, the law is in place to protect uh, people like Silva. Uh, we've advanced her cause uh, in the court. And uh, you know, only a jury can decide you know, who's right and who's wrong on, on these things. But the arguments that I think that we're advancing uh, are trying to change the, the dialogue and make the people who do the hard work in the field and produce the stories, report the stories, uh, make it so that it's a fair workplace and environment. And when the people who are asking the reporters in the field to put only eight hours on their timesheet, uh, when that's not factually true, uh, I think there's a lot of implications to uh, the uh, local station and to the network for their employees who are being asked to not report accurately, uh, something that's a key component for their job. So, uh, but we'll have to let the, the courts decide. Peter, we appreciate it. Silva, thank you very, so very much uh, for uh, sharing your story. Uh, again, as one of the folks involved in NABJ, uh, we're going to do our best to ensure that this external investigation uh, is done properly and fairly, that people are also going to be heard out. And so 
Um, again, the, they've, uh, CBS has already announced who that's going to be. Uh, we are going to be talking uh, with uh, those uh, lawyers uh, very soon, hopefully in the next uh, 48 hours, uh, to make clear how we believe this, this investigation should be conducted. Uh, and we'll stay on top of that. So we uh, certainly appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thanks for Thank you very much. All right, folks, back to in just one moment. It's time to be smart. When we control our institutions, we win. We win. This is the most important news show on television of any racial background. Y'all put two, three, four, five, 10, 15, 20, 30 dollars on this and keep this going. What you've done, Roland, since this crisis came out in full bloom. Anybody watching this, tell your friends. Go back and look at the last two weeks, especially of Roland Martin Unfiltered. I mean, hell, go back and look at the last two days. You've had sitting United States senators today, Klobuchar and Harris. Whatever you have that you have, you can bring to Roland Martin Unfiltered to support it. Please do, because this information may literally save your life. Watch Roland Martin Unfiltered daily at 6 p.m. Eastern on YouTube, Facebook, or Periscope, or go to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Support the Roland Martin Unfiltered Daily Digital Show by going to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. You want to support Roller Martin Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real as Roller Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roller Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to RollerMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RollerMartinUnfiltered.com. Uh, this shocking and unbelievable story out of Rochester, uh, New York, where a young black girl, nine years old, pepper sprayed by police officers. Shocking, shocking video that has people scratching their heads. What in the world is going on? Watch this. No! I want my dad! I'm not gonna run off. I want my dad! I want my dad! I'm not getting no car! I want my dad! I want my dad! No! Sir. Mom's still trying Wait, to Wait, please. Can you go help my mom? She's by. pregnant. Can you go help my mom? Water's She's pregnant. Please. Let's please. go. Get up. I want my dad. Get up. I want, I want my dad. I want my dad. I want my dad. I want my dad. I got one car out here. Mom's. I'm ready to take mom to jail too. Okay, but you need to get warm. Okay. 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 She, her. Okay. 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 Get in the car. I'm done telling you. Get in the car. Get in the car. Four, seven. So we're going to play for you the video of the police union defending that. We'll get that ready. Let me go to my panel right now. Dr. Avis Jones, the Weaver Leadership Strategist, uh, Mustafa, Mustafa Santiago Ali, uh, and former environmental justice, formerly with the EPA, Dr. Julian Mavo, President of Merida Bennett College. Uh, Avis, nine-year-old girl, cops gets called. They get called. He's a nine-year-old girl pepper sprayed okay and the cops like just pepper spray her you don't know when a nine-year-old child is throwing a t throwing a temper tantrum what you do is you just sit there and say let me know when you calm the hell down 
You don't pepper spray a nine-year-old girl. Well, you do when you don't see that nine-year-old girl as a human being. Uh, you do when you don't see her as a child. I don't even understand why you needed. I, I didn't even couldn't even finish counting the number of police cars that were there. It, it, it had to have been at least six, seven police cars there for one nine-year-old girl. This is what we mean when we talk about the, the dehumanization of Black bodies. That's exactly what it is. And once again, you contrast that with what we just saw a couple of weeks ago. Uh, people literally storming the Capitol, beating police officers with sticks, with hockey sticks, with uh, fire hoses, uh, with crutches, with everything, killing one, maybe others, and then they're getting escorted out of the, of the space completely untouched. And now you have this, and if you're going to bring in police unions into it, into the discussion, where are the police unions on that? I haven't heard well, you know, one Davis. police union say a one peep. So this is just what we what happens when you have a system that continuously and habitually dehumanizes and criminalizes black bodies. I don't care how young you are. I don't care what gender you are. You are perceived and treated as if you are a mortal threat by people who unfortunately have the power to utilize violence against you in any way they want to. And in the vast majority of situations, absolutely nothing happens to them as a result. You know, it's, it's, it's not just the dehumanization, it's also the defeminization. Would they have done that to a white girl? Hell to the no. So black women are systematically treated as we are less than other women. We are treated as if we don't matter. To pepper spay, the whole thing, I mean, my stomach was just nodding up. To pepper spray, to brutalize a child, that's what she was, a child, is to basically say, Dred Scott, Black people have no rights that whites are bound to respect. That was the Dred Scott decision. And here we are again, years later, looking at this and looking at this child. And I have to just emphasize that this child, because young Black women are not allowed a childhood. And that's a really big part of the challenge. Remember the young girl who was pulled by her uh, braids, her dreadlocks, um, by a police officer in Florida. But we see again and again and again, young black girls being treated like they're grown women. And even as grown women, they should not have had to deal with this. This is chilling. And I hope there are consequences, but we know that all too often they're not consequences that people get to do whatever they want to do to black people in general and black women in particular, and there tend to be no legal consequences to their abrupt, insane behavior. What happened here? I, I can't tell you. Anything about him. It was a, he came uh, to the scene shortly thereafter. They were trying to get her into the car and made a decision. He made a decision there uh, that he thought was the best action to take. Uh, you know, it resulted in her no injury to her. If mm. had they had to go and push further and, and use more force, there's a good chance she could have been hurt worse. Her, it's it's very, very difficult to get somebody into the back of a police car like that. And she's nine years old. Imagine what happens when we have a full-grown individual that we're dealing with. You talk about the psychological impact on the officers, but what about the psychological impact on the nine-year-old girl who had, who had to deal with this traumatic situation? How about the traumatic situations that she's been dealing with. Did you listen to the words that her mother was saying to her? That's what's sad. 
That's what's disturbing. That's what officers go home and say, how does that girl have a chance in life? What's that officer supposed to do? What can they do? You know what? Understand how we respond to situations. Let me go from a man with a gun call, a traffic accident, to a family disturbance, to another incident. After this, those officers probably had to go on to several other calls that night. This doesn't happen in a vacuum. Some of those officers probably didn't get a chance to even discuss it until when. And Mustafa, here's the issue here, okay? Police were responding to a family disturbance call. Um, the officers had to wrestle the young girl to the ground. This was a quote. Officer says, you're acting like a child. What does the nine-year-old say? Quote, I am a child. Now, uh, again, according to the police chief, the girl tried to run away. The officers then handcuffed her and attempted to take her to a hospital in the patrol car. This is the point that I keep raising, Mustafa. You cannot say, this is why when people talk about defund the police, when they talk about how you shift services, you should not be sending cops to a call that clearly there's a mental issue here. The young girl threatened to kill herself. You don't send cops. This is why you say, this is why you must have mental health professionals working in police departments or you have a system set up where you send mental health providers and not cops. Cops are going to do what cops do. Pull out guns, shoot people, tase them, pepper spray them. That's what happened here. And so for all the people, uh, you're so wrong about defund the police. This is what people are saying. You cannot have a law enforcement response to all problems in America. No, I agree. This is infuriating. You know, we continue to see this time and time and time again. And then especially when we see children are being placed in these situations, the little girl was scared, you know, so she had to actually go through trauma. She's seen police officers, whether on TV or in her own personal life, um, who have, you know, done all kinds of egregious things inside of our community. So that is how she's been socialized to uh, the interactions that happen with police. And when you don't, you know, they're supposed to be trained in de-escalation, whether it's with adults or children. And of course, a part of that de-escalation is making sure that you also have individuals who have expertise in dealing with children who are brought into the scene. And when you don't do that, you get these types of situations. And I'll just add the other thing. I know the asthma rates in, in Rochester, and I know that many black and brown children have asthma. So when you start pepper spraying children, who may or may not have asthma, you are also putting them in a life and death situation. So not only have you impacted her, you know, from a mental health side of the equation, dealing with the trauma from these police officers that he just got through talking about, well, what's the situation going to be like, you know, if some, when someone's an adult? Well, you've already put in place how that person is going to be fearful of you, how that person is not going to trust you. And then you also put their lives in danger because you don't know if that child has some type of a breathing difficulty. And you're also in a COVID-19 moment where I did not see people wearing masks. So you may have also exposed her to the virus. So there are a number of different dynamics that need to be addressed, but it goes back to the restructuring of, 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 our, of our police system in this country, which no one wants to have a serious conversation about that. And they just want to automatically shut it down and be like, well, that's folks of color who, you know, are just, you know, um, calling out these issues in a way that's not truthful. You see right here in color how serious these issues actually are and why change has to happen. Uh, we this is the thing over and over and over again, Avis, it keeps happening. And again, I go back to so many examples, Kojima Powell in St. Louis. The young man who was playing with a screwdriver uh, there in um, in Dallas. In fact, Rochester. This is the same police department where they put the bag over the head of the of the mentally disturbed brother and suffocated him. Same police department that led to massive resignations. Well, it looks like that not enough people resigned, right? I mean, you know, it seems like to me that police department needs to be cleared out there needs to be a cleaning house in that space. Uh, maybe there needs to be a Department of Justice investigation into 
uh, that police department uh, and have it operate under some sort of consent decree such that it can treat uh, the community to which it has sworn to protect and serve uh, as an entity that actually does protect and serve those citizens. Um, some deep rooted clean out. I mean, it seems to me this might be a situation where everybody needs to be fired and they need to hire people back one by one based on better qualifications, better criteria, because clearly there is a systemic problem with that police department in terms of how it interacts with the community in a very violent and un, un, inhumane way. There's just, there's no fixing that. It seems to be when you see the excuses that we just heard, there's justification for that behavior. You need that they will do it again. They don't see anything wrong with it. Ooh. And so because of that, they need to go and they all need to go. Julian, the thing here, and, and this is what we see this all the time, calling the cops if you're black could end in death. You know, Roland, it's a it's a dilemma for many black people because often there is intervention that's needed. But when the intervention requires the Rochester Police Department, the DC Police Department, whoever else police department, they come with their biases. So people should not be calling the police when a family member has a mental health crisis. There has to be someplace else for them to call. Because what we know, what we surely know about the police is that they come in with biases. This little girl, a nine-year-old girl, a nine-year-old was pepper sprayed, was handcuffed, was treated roughly because she was having a meltdown. That should never have happened. But the question then becomes, what are the resources in the community when a little girl has a meltdown. What are the resources? I mean, they shot a naked man in Atlanta. Naked, butt naked man. Um, obviously, he wanted his right mind running around butt naked. But he was shot because the police feared him. He didn't have anything on him, no gun, no knife. He just was butt naked. Now, maybe there's something else they feared. We're not going to go there. But the point is that these people come with their biases and we need as they, we need to get rid of these people and their biases if you cannot deal with empathy and humanity then you should not be on a police force and with a nine-year-old girl and i keep saying that it, it hurts me to my soul a little girl who is in a mental health crisis because i don't know what's going on in her house and her household but she's in a crisis. So you pepper spray her and handcuff her? You don't have anybody to talk to her? Who are these people? What are these people? And why are these people on a public payroll? All right, folks, back to that my unfiltered video in just one moment. It's time to be smart. When we control our institutions, we win. We win. This is the most important news show on television of any racial background. Y'all put two, three, four, five, ten, fifteen, twenty, thirty dollars on this and keep this going. What you've done, Roland, since this crisis came out in full bloom. Anybody watching this, tell your friends. Go back and look at the last two weeks, especially of Roland Martin Unfiltered. I mean, hell, go back and look at the last two days. You've had sitting United States senators today, Klobuchar and Harris. Whatever you have that you have, you can bring to Roland Martin Unfiltered to support it. Please do, because this information may literally save your life. Watch Roland Martin Unfiltered daily at 6 p.m. Eastern on YouTube, Facebook, or Periscope, or go to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Support the Roland Martin Unfiltered Daily Digital Show by going to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. You want to support Roller Martin Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real as Roller Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roller Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to RollerMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RollerMartinUnfiltered.com. I, I do got to get your reaction to what we just talked about. 
the pepper spraying of a nine-year-old girl. Mom calls the calls the cops. The girl was threatening to kill herself. Uh, the cop says, you're acting like a little child. And she says, I am a child. Right. I am a child. Yeah. And, and Roland, can you hear me? Yeah, we got you. Go yeah. ahead. Yeah. One of the things I'm thinking about. So you pepper spray a nine-year-old girl who's in a mental crisis, but you don't pepper spray grown folk that aren't crazy who who stormed the Capitol with guns and beat people with fire hydrants and kill people. And and uh, I mean, the, just think about that for a moment, y'all. Yeah, no pepper spray was used <laughs> on the US Capitol and they were storming the Capitol, tossing aside people. barricades, B right. Beating people with flags, uh, right. yeah, and you talk to them. I mean, it, I, I, that's what's you know. I'm real close to saying words I try not to say when I'm listening to this. So you, <laughs> the grown folk, you know, the grown, the grown white folk, uh, come in. They're climbing walls. They're using all kinds of barricades. They um, are beating people, hitting them with you know flagpoles and fire hydrants. They can zip ties. They are saying they're coming to lynch somebody, telling you what they're going to do. We're coming to lynch. We're coming to hurt. We're coming to destroy. No pepper spray. What, what we saw was folks saying, hey, how you doing? This is your house. Oh, by the way, come on in. Didn't we hear a nine-year-old girl? I mean, the, the reality is, this is what I think. I don't think any of this is going to stop until, number one, we can actually bring not local but federal charges for murder and felony assault that have large penalties against police without any um, 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 any way they can get around it. Number two, we are going to have to have insurance companies say we will no longer insure your police uh, agency um, and pay people off if, if you're engaged in this kind of racist uh, uh, activity. And number three, when we talk about defunding, I've been thinking about this. You know, there's a process. It's not what, what everybody wants yet, but there is a process for defunding already in place. It's called Title VI, Civil Rights Act of 1964. It said that anybody that gets federal money, that engages in discriminatory tactics, the federal government can defund them. Problem is, we haven't been doing it. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? The law is there. It's, it's inside. Now, it's not finally what Black Lives Matter. I'm not trying to suggest that. But I'm trying to say that until we can have, that they know they're not going to be left up to the local DAs. Federal charges for federal, felony murder or for felony assault, number one. The private insurance companies that insure these folks saying, we're not going to insure your company, you know, just like your insurance company, you can have life insurance, but if you go out and pay to commit suicide, then they're not going to pay, right? So it should be the same way if a police department, in essence, if you kill an innocent people, you are committing a form of policy suicide, and we're not going to protect you. We will break the your city, your county will just have to go broke because you have no business doing that. And thirdly, we should be using Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. I heard you say Rochester. This is just another time they've done it before. You can, you, we will pull your federal money, or you're going to fire the people and get this thing straight. That's what's going to. But look now, at again. I, I you know, I, whew, you know, I'm about love and all that, more Roland. But I didn't see no pepper spray. Maybe it was a few instances when it really got rough. But but for the most part, I saw people fussing and cussing and running and and breaking and trying and 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 it was not even a shot rang out. A million black people came to the million man march, and not one act of violence. Quarter million people came with and, and with the march on Washington, not one act of violence. We did six weeks in the poor people's campaign of actions at the Capitol and 43 other places around the country. And Roland, they arrested us every time for praying. You talk about going up the steps, they arrested us at the bottom of the steps. So mm. <laughs> I have no tolerance for this, you know, and we've got to stop it. And it's only going to stop when people have penalty. And we can no longer leave it up to the local. It's got to be a federal penalty. And it's got to be harsh, harsh, a penalties for it and we've got to pull the money back all right folks back to that whole mark unfiltered video in just one moment it's time to be smart 
When we control our institutions, we win. We win. This is the most important news show on television of any racial background. Y'all put two, three, four, five, 10, 15, 20, 30 dollars on this and keep this going. What you've done, Roland, since this crisis came out in full bloom. Anybody watching this, tell your friends, go back and look at the last two weeks, especially of Roland Martin Unfiltered. I mean, hell, go back and look at the last two days. You've had sitting United States senators today, Klobuchar and Harris. Whatever you have that you have, you can bring to Roland Martin Unfiltered to support it. Please do, because this information may literally save your life. Watch Roland Martin Unfiltered daily at 6 p.m. Eastern on YouTube, Facebook, or Periscope, or go to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Support the Roland Martin Unfiltered Daily Digital Show by going to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. You want to support Roller Martin Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real as Roller Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roller Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to RollerMartinUnfiltered.com. You can make this possible. You know, Scott, I know you might be comfortable with them Trump people, um, but I just... I, I just could not stay in. I, I told y'all what... I, did I tell y'all what happened the first time they had a meeting at the White House with the TV anchors with Trump? You you have a couple times. Let me, no, I didn't. But tell us again. Let, Go on. No, no, I, <laughs> I, I, I actually didn't. I don't think I told y'all this. Y'all, this is a really true story. Normally, when the president <laughs> walks into the room, everybody stands up. You know, you, you're you eager. You know, Mr. President, good to meet you. Good to see you. You walked over. All right. I ain't really had that feeling. He came into the room, all the other media people, Jake Tapper and uh, Did you other stand boys, up? Uh, Chuck, Chuck Todd, and they all them, they all moved toward Lester Holt, they all moved toward Mr. President. I fell the hell back. I was like, well, he got walked past here anyway, so <laughs> let me. <laughs> y'all think I'm, I, I, y'all think I'm lying. I did. I felt like, well, hell, he got to walk over here to get to his side of the table. <laughs> I'm like, I ain't in no rush to shake his damn hand. And they all walk up there going, Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. Trump. And I'm sitting there going, I can't call this some bitch, Mr. President. I just can't do it. Then I said, I can't call him Mr. Trump. I said, now we got a dilemma. What am I going to call him? (laughs) So he making his way. He getting closer and closer. I'm like, damn, what am I going to call him? Then he finally gets up to me, and I go, he stick his hand out. Good to see you. I go, hi. (laughs) You just said hi? I did. I went, Hi. Monique, I'm not lying. I am not lying. My mouth. No, not... you never told this story. My mouth. Yeah, you never told this my... story. I'm sharing it with others. My mouth could not fix itself <laughs> to say. I, I couldn't. I didn't say Mr. President. I didn't say Mr. Trump. I didn't even say Donald. I went, hi. How you doing? My no, name is I, that's all I said. <laughs> Hi. That was it. Oh, good to see you. And did he say anything back to you? That's all he said. Then he said, then he said, good to see you. I'm like, mm. and then good sat my you. sat my ass at the, at the all the way at the end of the table. Three black people. We were all over here on one side of the table. <laughs> It was the three. It was the the three black people. The three that had less the hope sitting two seats from him. But they had me, Yamish, and we were all. We were like we were like truly in the hood. Uh, but they, but at least Scott Pelley and David Muir were with us over there in the hood as well. But y'all, I couldn't even I couldn't even say nothing. It was just I couldn't. It was just hi. You see, well, that that was your opportunity to ask about the advertising. Nah, you hell no, nah. I couldn't. Like, Look at the ears. We need the money right now. We black. What room is it in? We Where does black. the money reside? Ink we black. I ain't, I ain't. Got the money. I ain't even gonna give y'all my response at the next meeting when Milani was there. Oh I, my goodness! I literally did one of them Bernie Max. That look up and down like, 
Why, why you here? I ain't even... Y'all don't understand. I had just disdain for them people. Okay, all right, y'all. All right, folks, back to that roadblock unfiltered video in just one moment. It's time to be smart. When we control our institutions, we win. We win. This is the most important news show on television of any racial background. Y'all put two, three, four, five, ten, fifteen, twenty, thirty dollars on this and keep this going. What you've done, Roland, since this crisis came out in full bloom. Anybody watching this, tell your friends. Go back and look at the last two weeks, especially of Roland Martin Unfiltered. I mean, hell, go back and look at the last two days. You've had sitting United States senators today, Klobuchar and Harris. Whatever you have that you have, you can bring to Roland Martin Unfiltered to support it. Please do, because this information may literally save your life. Watch Roland Martin Unfiltered daily at 6 p.m. Eastern on YouTube, Facebook, or Periscope, or go to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Support the Roland Martin Unfiltered Daily Digital Show by going to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. You want to support Roller Martin Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real as Roller Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roller Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to RollerMartinUnfiltered.com. You can make this possible. I got it. Robert, are you like me? Do, do you wake up feeling a little better knowing ignorant fools not in the White House? I mean, I'm just, I, I mean, I, I was driving, I was, dri I had to get here early this morning uh, for this education thing, and I was driving, and I was drive by the old executive office building, and it was just like, damn, it feels nice not to have some dumbasses you gotta wake up to every morning. I mean, am I the only one? Well, uh, well no, I think if, uh, no if race part, many people feel that way. Just, just the fact that I've gone several days since the uh, the inauguration and not watched any news and not thought about politics the entire day. And it's been great to not have to worry. Did the president tweet out something? Did the president try to invade Ohio? Uh, you know, did he make uh, Miss, o uh, Miss San Diego the new secretary of state? Anything could have happened and that not existing anymore is very important. But despite that, it is important for us to stay vigilant on our government. Because remember, these folks were not our friends or allies. We were allies out of convenience. And be, now that the convenience, now that the mutual threat is over, you know, I, I think uh, Churchill once said that if Hitler was invading hell, then I would become, uh, become allies with the devil. Uh, that's the position we are uh, very much in with some of the people who are part of this coalition. And now that that extant uh, threat is over, it's time to make sure that we're not being left out as we move forward with the new administration, with the new policies, and ensure that the things that we got out there and voted for and fought for and marched for are actually being executed. Look, I, look, Monique, I, I agree with all that. That's fine. All I'm saying is just literally driving by the White House. I mean, you can feel the sanity return. I mean, I'm sitting, oh, there, absolutely. I'm sitting there driving, and I said, I was like, y'all smell that? Clean, fresh air. Not the funk <laughs> of dumbass Not the stench. People. Not the, <laughs> the stench <laughs> of corruption. Oh. I mean, I'm, I'm, I am not lying. Stitch. I'm just driving Did in the car stitch? like... You, no, you don't understand. Man, driving down E Street and going up, the closer I got to the White House... Monique, it was the equivalent of when you are near an evil-ass person. And when they move in closer, you just like... The, the Bible talks about... T, don't even get me started when you got when you're around evil people. You just like, just... Mm -hmm. Your face just like, damn, here they ass come. I just... Uh, oh, here they come. That's literally what it feels like. Those <laughs> folks were evil. All of them. Everybody who worked there. All, him on down. It rotted, yep. it rotted from the head down. Just, but just to have confident people, to watch a press briefing and they speaking in complete sentences. You like, man, I forgot what that was like. Last night, to watch a procession to pay respects to a cop who gets killed. You didn't have no ignorant statement, no big old show. Y'all notice everybody ran it except Fox News. I thought they love cops. Mm. I'm just simply saying, mm. 
it is nice to wake up and not to wake up to a ignorant tweet from a ignorant fool who was married to a ignorant woman who they were all hired a bunch of ignorant ass people. Yes. <laughs> and you're you're like deep in your Chris Rock right now. I'm but... not, I'm just I, I you're right. Y'all, don't, y'all, like don't, I'm, y'all don't understand. I was just like turned up. I was like, damn, man, it feels nice. It it feels... Does. The fact that they're even having the, the the press conferences and then there's competent delivery from it and then they, they invite the experts to just come in and talk. Nobody hovers over them like helicopter mode to st- to jump in and stop them. They have these COVID briefings, you know, and it's, it's all sane and straight talk and good information. And uh, we're not traumatized daily by these tweets and not knowing when the next one is going to come. Now, we all have some PTSD. We probably need to get checked out because... It was a rough four years, and we have had so many losses. Uh, and I'm so I'm I'm in agreement with Robert. We shouldn't be at ease in Zion, but we definitely can breathe better knowing that there is competence at the head than we could before. So I'm thankful. That this this, this is the equivalent to me of you know this is the equivalent when somebody invites you to their house and they know how to cook. <laughs> <laughs> You you look forward, you look forward to to the dinner. But ain't nothing worse when you get invited by somebody who can't cook. And now you gotta sit here and just lie and say your ass just ate. Or when they force you to eat, you like, okay, just give me a taste. Cause you know they can't cook. I'm just saying, it's just I Look, I, I ain't know about y'all, but... All right, folks, back to our Roadmark Unfiltered video in just one moment. It's time to be smart. When we control our institutions, we win. We win. This is the most important news show on television of any racial background. Y'all put two, three, four, five, ten, fifteen, twenty, thirty dollars on this and keep this going. What you've done, Roland, since this crisis came out in full bloom. Anybody watching this, tell your friends. Go back and look at the last two weeks, especially of Roland Martin Unfiltered. I mean, hell, go back and look at the last two days. You've had sitting United States senators today, Klobuchar and Harris. Whatever you have that you have, you can bring to Roland Martin Unfiltered to support it. Please do, because this information may literally save your life. Watch Roland Martin Unfiltered daily at 6 p.m. Eastern on YouTube, Facebook, or Periscope, or go to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Support the Roland Martin Unfiltered Daily Digital Show by going to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RolandMartinUnfiltered.com.